Hi, and welcome to our service. If you're new here, you may be wondering who we are and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and his love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into his word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along his path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges, and none of us are perfect. But we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey, because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome.
Good morning. Good to see you. Hope you've had a good week. If you haven't had a, the greatest of weeks, you're exactly where you need to be. If you've had an awesome week, you're exactly where you need to be. It is just good to get together and uh, walk through life having shared worship and uh, Bible study together. We invite you to join us in uh, what I pray is a testimony of your life today. And when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. Let's stand together and you sing. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share when the chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder 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 Let me welcome you. You may be seated. Let me welcome you to the services today. If you're a guest with us inside your celebration guide, there's a little white sheet that says welcome. You can fill that out and you can drop it in the offering plate. Here up on the front, there's some on a banister and on the table and one in the foyer. Or you can do better than that. You can bring it to my left, your right, after the service, and I've got a couple of gifts for you. I'll be over there looking forward to uh, share with you if you uh, would like to do that. Let me mention that Operation Christmas Child underway. You'll see a video about that in just a few minutes and the impact of the shoebox ministry. Just a powerful, powerful thing that God is doing. The Awana is, is kicked off and doing well. We still need a Awana store coordinator. And if you know about Awana, you know that's so important to the children. And then we need some van drivers and riders. And you can contact the streets if you would. And if you're listening by radio because you couldn't get onto YouTube, I understand that YouTube's having some a problem with, with it. But you can go to Facebook, and you can go to Facebook and put in the initials for, for uh, First Baptist Church, Cherokee Village, FBCCV, and you will, um, you'll be able to uh, view the service there. And so if you type in Cherokee Village, you, won't get, you probably won't get it. But if you go to FBCCV, the initials, you'll get that. And then uh, the, I want to say you got some thank yous on your, in your guide there. And also disaster relief. Sulphur, Louisiana, where we've been helping and you've been gracious in giving and we're planning a trip to go down there. They were hit, as you know, this week. Again, they were right where it hit again. And uh, the pastor in there and his wife had evacuated again, and those people, and then they, they got back in there last night. And uh, it's just a, a mess there still, and got, now they got more. But this was not nearly as bad as the other, but I uh, want to continue to pray for them. And so it's good to see you in the Lord's house today. I hope you're having a great day, and if you're joining us by video or by radio, we're glad that you're part of the services. Let's join together, and we'll pray together. Father, I want to thank you today that we can come and talk to you. We ask you to just speak powerfully today. Lord, I ask you to open your word to our hearts. Feed us from your table. 
And Father, we ask that you take these songs and just draw us into, into the deepest worship, connection and song with you. And in your word today, we ask for your glory. We ask you to bind the enemy that he'll have no place in our lives, that we will be open and hearing from you and obedient to you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Lina la meke a ni testu mo ke mo lwa pe le ba le lwa palani re nna mo mo le polo le mo botswana Nje nya na ya meke ya ke yone thae ka mo se ke a mo le tlong o khatlegile ke tume se thata mo Ke <laughs> God knows where those boxes go that you bring here each year and the lives they touch. And I think that'll be part of the joy of heaven is finding out how we were all influential with others. As we continue to worship today, let's just focus on the great gift of salvation at the cross, exclaimed to be the true end of things with the empty tomb. Let's stand together once again as we sing. When I survey the wondrous cross Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
demands my soul, my life, my all. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my His name is wonderful. Take your Bibles and look in Hebrews chapter 1. We're looking in the book of Hebrews. I've been talking about faith. We've been talking about Jacob's faith. And so I thought uh, as I was uh, praying about what to, uh, to follow up with that, I wanted to just go through a time where we looked at what is faith and how does it work in our lives. So uh, I welcome you, to, you that are joining by Facebook or by the radio and we apologize for the YouTube thing not working, but hopefully we'll get that uh, corrected as soon as we can. But God made you for better things than this world has to give. Hebrews 11.1 1 is going to be our focus. But let's pray together. Would you uh, bow in a moment of prayer and thank our Heavenly Father? Think of a, a particular blessing and thank Him for that blessing. Now would you pray for someone who is in need? Would you ask our Father to help us grow in faith and understand what it means? Would you pray for revival in the church, in America and around the world, and for spiritual awakening for those who are unsaved? Father, we want to thank you today, and you are so good to us. There's so many things, such a long list of all the good things that you do in our lives every moment, every day. Thank you. And Lord, we want to pray for those who are in need. We lift them up to you. You've heard your people prayer. Lord, you know, they know in their own lives things they're asking you for. And we ask you to meet those needs. We ask you to, to grow us in faith, mature our faith to where we're more like Jesus. We pray for revival, a returning to Christ with all of our hearts, our first love. We pray for those who are unsaved, that they will know Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to speak now. We ask for your glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Recently, I uh, talked about Jacob's life and him becoming such a man of faith. And God wants us to be people of faith. He wants us to live in faith. And so God made you for better things than what the world can give you. Throughout the Bible, God teaches us that faith is the way that we access the things that God has for us. By faith, it started in Genesis, by faith Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And all through the Bible, the people who trust God, they were rewarded. We're going to see. 
So faith is foundational to your life with Christ. Everything about your life that God has for you must involve faith, and it's accessed by faith. So what is faith? Well, God tells us in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now that is not abundantly clear. But I take, I take the Greek words and I do some study, so I paraphrased it as best as I can understand these words. I've been working on this, matter, matter of fact, for many, many years. Studied a lot of people, a lot smarter than me, and uh, just studying these words, studying what is God saying when he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I paraphrased it with some comments, and here's the way I did it. Now, faith is the assurance of things expected in the future, a conviction based on evidence of the past that things not yet seen are real and will come to pass. And so that's the best way that I could put in my, in English and in my words and Arkansas language, as I like to call it. So the expected things are confidently looked for because God has shown us and he's taught us what we can expect. You know, it's like this. I know that one day, unless Christ returns, and if he does return, my faith tells me he's going to catch me away to be with him. And if I die before that day, I'm going to go to be with him. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So faith is looking for things that I don't see yet, but I'm expecting them. And I'm, I'm confident in them. And so I'm waiting on those things to happen. So here's a point of truth. Biblical faith is a manner of operation of life. It's not like I live my life over here. And so today I have a need, so I'm going to exercise faith. I'm going to have some faith. No, faith is a way we live. We live by faith. We live in faith. We operate by faith. And the Bible says that our Christian life goes from faith to faith. We start with faith and we grow in faith. We move forward in faith. Everything has faith. And you say, so what, what, do, you, what do you mean when you talk about faith? I'm talking about we're confident in the things God says. Now, sometimes God will speak to us apart from his word. In other words, or through his word, he'll tell us things. Let me give you an example. When, I, when God called me to preach when I was 20 years old, God was working in my life, and he called me into, to, to himself to be a pastor. Well, when I first started thinking like that, I thought I was crazy. I thought, God calls good people. He doesn't call people like me. He calls good people. I always thought of our pastors and people like they lived in a different world. You know, I mean, they were just like... They lived in a, a, a you know, they, they did like live by high standard, but I just thought that they just never had messed up. You know, they had to be right. And, and I had messed up, and I, and I thought, well, so I read the Bible through, and what I found out was that God calls the low things. Instead of disqualifying me, I fit right in. He calls the base things. And, and as I read through his word, he convinced me more and more that he was calling me into the ministry. And so... That's what I did with my, with my life. And so, uh, you know, it, it, and faith is like, well, I couldn't turn to a certain book of the Bible and say, okay, God's calling Larry White to be a pastor. Or, you know, I just couldn't find it. It's not in there. But God convinced me through his word, by studying his word, that that's what he wanted in my life and through the, his work of his spirit. You know, I would go to bed. I was a farmer. I would go to bed at night, and I couldn't get off my mind. God wants you to preach. And I would say, that can't be right. God calls good people. I'd wake up in the morning, and the first thing on my mind was, God wants me to preach. And so I said, I'm going to read the Bible through, and I'm going to, I'm going to show that that can't be right. And I read the Bible through and found out that it wasn't right. And so... That's how God speaks. He speaks. Now God speaks in a lot of different ways. He speaks through circumstances. He speaks through a lot of things, and God does. And so, but you have to try the voices of what you think God, it's, that it's God. Be careful because God, you know, God's always right. And if you, if you, if you think you've heard from God and it's not right, then don't, don't believe that's God. And so here's two ways to live your life. You can live your life by your personal plans, purposes, and responses to this physical world you see. That is a natural way to live life. That's the way we lived life before Christ. Before we knew Jesus, we just lived our lives by our plans and our purposes and our responses to this physical world. 
and uh, that, when I grew up on a farm, grew up farming, all of my family were farmers. And I, you know, my, my dad was a farmer, my brother, older brother's a farmer. I mean, I'm a farmer, and I've been farming since I was left grade in high school. It was just fell to me that I was going to be a farmer, and that's what I planned. And I saw my life being on that dirt, doing that job, and that's what I was going to do. And then when God called me to preach, I thought, well, you know what? God's. I was saved in a small church, about 30 people, with a bivocational pastor. I mean, he had another job, so I thought, well, God's going to call me as a farmer. I'm going to farm and pastor a church, and and maybe I'll leave some boys like me, you know, to, to Christ and, and little girls and guys and gals, you know. And so that's where I started. And then God slowly moved that in, uh, away for me to, you know, desire to go to school and those kind of things and to, to move forward. And, and so, but I've, I start off with my personal plans and, I, my, and the purpose. And I respond. That's the way I did. And that's the way everybody does, I guess. But here's the second thing. But a person of faith, you can live by faith in God, His Word, and His promises. In other words, what happens in the world around you doesn't determine your stability because you're trusting somebody who's bigger than the world around you. You see, Paul said it this way in, in writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We walk by faith, not by sight. So it's not just the things we see around us, although we have to deal with the world around us, but we see something bigger. I'm reminded of Elisha, the prophet, when he was on a mountainside, he and his servant. And the enemy came against him, and an army came out to arrest him. And they were going to arrest this prophet because the prophet kept telling the king what was going on because God was giving the prophet information. And so they, he surrounds them, and the servant goes berserk. Isn't that the name of the Gishia or something? Gishia, I think it is. He, he, goes, he, gets, he goes up to, his, to the master, Elisha, and he says, Oh, Lord, my Lord, how shall we do? And he says, Lord, open his eyes. And he opened his eyes and he saw all these angels on the mountain and all around them, these angels with fly, fiery uh, angels. It's an army, the Lord of hosts, all around them. And suddenly he, he, you see, so to walk by faith is that, you know, the world may become very hostile to us and it's becoming hostile, more hostile to Christians in America than it's ever been. But listen, there's an army of angels do you know the Bible says angels are sent? Hebrews 1 says, tells, chapter 1 tells us they're sent as ministering spirits to those who are the heirs of eternal life. They're here to help us. You know, I don't see them. I've never seen an angel that I know of. If I did, I was unaware like the Bible says some do. But I'll tell you something. I know there are angels around. I know they watch over us. I know I've been pretty dumb at times, and God spared me from my own bad decisions. And I look back and I say, you know, God just had to spare me. God, God works. So there is an unseen world. And so we have to say that God has a better world for us to live in. So while we live in this physical world, we also live in a spiritual world. In other words, when something happens in our lives, we don't have to say, why did that happen? Uh, and, and get mad at people and attack people. We can say, you know, God, we, you, I'm a, you know, I want to know why. Maybe if you'll show me, but God... I'm just trusting you, that you're in control. And that brings peace into our lives. Someone said, faith in Jesus will take your soul to heaven. That's how we get saved, faith in Jesus. But it said, growing faith in Jesus will bring heaven to your soul. And so you don't have to just live in a world and, 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 and hope and wish for some day and for the sweet by and by. You can say, you know what, I'm going to live in faith in Jesus now. And when you do, it brings stability into your life. It brings power into your life to deal with life and to face life. We don't merely live in what we can do. We live in the reality of what God can do. Just like your eyesight is the sense by which you see this material world, your faith is the spiritual sense in which you see this unseen world with your mind. You don't see it visibly with your mind, with your heart. People live by faith. They see everything through the lens of God. I told you before, one of the things that I like, there are a couple of things I like to say to me when life hits me. God, what are you saying? And how do you want me to respond? You see, when things go bad in my life, God's up to something. That's just what we got to do. People who have faith in God have confidence in God. They trust God. And so the second verse, I'm just going to touch on this and I'm going to come back to it in a minute. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Now, let me paraphrase this with some comments. Through faith, God's people who live before us 
those who lived to honor him gathered to themselves a good testimony. He, he's saying, look, it was by faith. This whole book, chapter 11, is about faith, just like the Bible is, but this is about defining faith and ex, ex, describing faith and illustrating faith. He gives you all these people, this list of people, who by faith, they, they did what God wanted them to do. They did the will of God. So faith, those who lived before we lived, we can look at their lives and say, you know what? They had faith in God, and God brought them through. Many of them, in the last half of this book, the last part of this book, they died as martyrs. But they did it in faith. And God said they conquered. They were victorious in faith, even though physically they died. People who live by faith see everything through the lens of God. They have confidence in God. And, I, and so as we look at this, we see... And I'm going to come back to this verse in just a minute, verse 2. But verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things which appear. Now here's what we believe as little creationists. We believe that there was nothing, and God spoke everything into existence from nothing. Alana, I I, I get to lead our sixth graders on Wednesday night uh, during a, a lesson time. And I asked them this past week, I said, Have you ever made anything? Uh, and they said, yes. And I said, what did you make? And they told me some of the things they'd made. And I said, did you make it out of something or did you make it out of nothing? And they said, well, I made it out of something. I said, well, God created the world out of nothing. And so, and, and that's what he's saying. Literal creationists believe that nothing was here, that it was void and empty just like God says it was, and God spoke the universe into existence. That's what God says, and we believe that. Now, how do we know that? We believe it by faith. Now, let's move on. Uh, Verse 4. By faith, Abel... Now, if you know the story of Cain and Abel, they were the kids of Adam and Eve. These were the first ones who brought sacrifices that we know of that God tells us about to the Lord. So, uh, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts... And by it, he being dead yet speaks. Now, he died a long, long time ago, but his faith is still speaking to us because of what God said about him. Now, I want you to see these verse 2. I said we'd come back to it. Verse 2 and verse 4. All of the underlined... I'm sorry, on the radio you can't see it, but in verse 2, it's obtained a good report. In verse 4, it's he obtained witness and then God testifying. All three of those are from the same Greek word. If you and I could read Greek, we would read those and it would be the same Greek word. And you say, well, what what, what are you saying? What's it say then? It says that they obtained a good report, these elders, those that lived before us, that, that Abel offered and he obtained a good report and that God gave a good report about his gifts. Now look at this. I I paraphrase it this way. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he brought to himself the testimony that he was a righteous man. Therefore, God gave testimony of his righteousness based on his faith to offer the sacrifice God asked for him, which continues to speak to the, to the effectiveness of faith, even though he died long ago. So here's what it, they did. God told them, obviously God told them to bring a blood sacrifice. Cain brought a fruit of the ground. He was a farmer. He brought the fruit of the ground. But Abel brought a blood sacrifice. God accepted the blood sacrifice, but he didn't accept the other. Now, some people, you know, say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's look in Hebrews chapter 12. Talking about Jesus, it says, and Jesus, and to Jesus, talking about things that Jesus did, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling, which was his own blood, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. You see, Abel brought the right kind of sacrifice that was accepted And it was a blood sacrifice, a sprinkling of blood. And God said he accepted that and he 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 put to Abel's account that he is a righteous man because by faith he did what God told him to do. He by faith did according with the sacrifice that God asked for. Cain didn't. Cain did what he thought was best. And folks, listen, here's here's what we do by faith. We do what God asked for. That's what makes it faith. You say, well, I'm going to do the Christian life my way. Well, it's not going to be accepted. You've got to do it God's way. And that is with Christ and Christ alone. And so God, didn't, God gives a long list in Hebrews 11 of people who are conquered by faith. 
they did that great exploits or either they died uh, faithful to God and victoriously in death because they say true to God. And here's what he said. He didn't do it to magnify the people. He did it to illustrate the power of faith in, in himself, those who have faith in God. You know the people, when you go back and read their stories, they're just as weak as we were. Remember when Abraham, this great man of faith, he'll get to him in, in this chapter. You know, Abraham and all of these guys, you know, Abraham lies and says Sarah's not his wife because he's scared, remember? You know, you can find something on almost all of them. Holes in their lives. That's the way we are. Until Jesus uh, finishes with us. And one thing, one good thing that we know by faith, he says that he started something in us and he's going to complete it. And one day we're going to be made into his likeness. And so as we, we need to move on. Now, let's suppose you, if, you, if you and I say we're people of faith and we in the church, we say that we're people in faith and we need to operate in faith. What do you mean? We need to live every day in faith. That's what we are. We're people of faith. It's not just something I add to my faith when I have a need or add to my life when I have a need. It is something that I live. You want to be a man of faith. You want to be a woman of faith. You want to be a person of faith. Now, when you think about this, let's say, give me a, I'll give you an example. Suppose I were to say to you, well, God did a great work in my life this week, and uh, I have Superman powers now. I'm like Superman. More like Winnie Man, but I'm just saying for example. I'm like Superman. If I said that, what would you say? I said it in the first service, somebody said, fly. If I say I'm Superman, you know what? People are going to say, prove it. If I really have superpowers, then I should be able to exhibit superpowers. And that's what the Bible says in James. That's what's talking about faith. If we're going to say we're people of faith, we ought to have the life that matches it. Or the, or the testimony loses its power. The time, well, here's what God wants. God wants to brag on your life like he brags on these people. Not because of you, but because of the power of faith. That when you have faith in him, he makes ordinary people extraordinary people. And if you read this, some of these things were supernatural that they, they accomplished. Now, the best thing I want to do is, uh, that I know of to tell us what this looks like how to do this is found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and following. The whole passage is about it. We're going to break into the paragraph and, and just cover this because of our time. But I'm going to give you seven things. Very fast, I'm going to try to do seven things. And I did get it done in the first service. I hope I can in this one. All right, first, we need to add to our faith. He said, giving, beside this, giving all diligence, and that means striving for. That's the way I used to say, I like to say it. Strive for. None of us have apprehended. None of us are like Jesus yet, but we're to strive for it. We're to press for it, like Paul said. And so the Bible teaches us. So give all diligence. That means do with all that within you. Add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. So we ask ourselves, what is virtue? Virtue means, it means brave excellence. That's why I said grow in brave excellence. When I looked this up and I was looking at the Hebrew word and studied the word, what I saw was brave excellence. And I saw how that... The Christian life, to live in faith, has to have brave excellence. Because you're not going to be popular all the time if you, do, but if you live by faith. I told the young people this morning, your friends are not always going to like it if you have brave excellence. But you need to have brave excellence. If you're a young person listening to this, you need to have brave excellence. Because, you, listen, I said this in the first service and I'll say it now. I can say to this very congregation, I can tell you that, where you don't have brave excellence and you know you ought to have, you'll have scars that you, you'll bear for all of your life. Can I get an amen, adults? Amen. Amen. Wouldn't it, if we could go back, wouldn't we do a lot of things differently? Wouldn't we be brave in excellence rather than being brave in evil? You see, uh, be brave in excellence, not in evil. Do you know it's easy to be to be brave in defiance to your parents, I told the young people. Do you know it's easy to be brave in defiance to people in authority? It is easy to be brave in defiance and roll your eyes at your parents or, or, or stomp your foot or, or just some way to manipulate them to show and try to get them to do what you want to do. 
That's normal. And it's what, it, because we come into this world brave and evil, bent toward that. It's easy to be brave in selfishness and wrong. But it takes faith to be brave in excellence because faith says, you know what, if I'll be brave in excellence, God will bless my life. God will do extraordinary things through my life if I'll be brave in excellence. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to grow in spiritual intelligence. When he says, give all diligence, add to your, uh, your faith virtue, which is brave excellence, and to brave excellence, knowledge. Now, when you talk about knowledge, you're talking, what are you talking about? You're talking about that which is right. What is right? It's truth. To have the knowledge, to know what is right. And as I look at this, I want to tell you, uh, the, uh, there's this passage of Scripture. In Romans chapter 10, I want to read it. Here's some people who were zealous. They thought they were right. They were brave in a lot of ways. But they were wrong. It's the Israelites. And this is what God said in Jesus' day. Though, uh, Paul is praying. I mean, listen to what Paul says. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a great zeal of God. They strive a lot, but not according to knowledge. Not according to knowledge. They weren't doing it right. They were serious. They were committed, but not according to truth. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For the Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone that believeth. There are people today who are hoping that their goodness is going to merit with them salvation. The Jews believe that. But God sent another righteousness into the world, the righteousness of Christ. And if you have His righteousness put to your account, you have faith. You say, you know what? You say, Brother Lay, how do you, why do you know you're going to heaven? Why, do you, why are you convinced? Why do you expect to go to heaven when you die? Because Jesus died on the cross for me. Not anything I do, not anything I'm doing today or tomorrow. I, it's because Jesus died as my substitute. My faith in Jesus tells me I'm expecting to be with Jesus forever. And that's the way it should be. That's the way we should work. Now, but we've got to grow. And so here is the third thing. Grow in self-control. When he says, uh, add to your faith this uh, virtue and knowledge, and, and then he says self-control, temperance. Is the idea of temperance. Now, the word temperance, if you've got a different version, it probably says self-control. Most uh, translate it that way. Which means to master your appetites and desires. To master your appetites and desires. Self-control. To be ruling in your life. Listen, you, if, if you don't have a fresh moving of faith in Jesus and growing in Him you're not going to have victory over your desires. And you can't skip spaces. See, it's not like a board game. Go ahead three spaces. No, God says you start with faith, and then you grow in faith. And you move forward in faith. And that's what we have to do. So you add to your faith. And if you don't add to your faith these things, your desires will rule over you. Your, your appetites will rule over you unless you rule over them. And how do you rule over them? You rule over them by faith. You believe in that God has given you the power, and he's already said that he has, and that we uh, shall not be under the dominion, no longer under the dominion of sin. We have the power to put our appetites into their proper place. Are you aware what makes worldly-minded people stand against righteousness and truth? They want to do life their way. That's what they want. If they give in to what's right, they don't get to do what they, they want to do. All of us battle it every day. I'm not just beating up on them. I'm telling you, that's me every day. I have to have the faith to trust God that what he says is right, or I'm going to do what I want to do. And if I do what I want to do, it gets me in trouble. Sometimes immature believers will have a lack of self-control. We understand that. But as we grow we should be coming more and more like the thinking and the heart and the mind of Jesus. And the fourth thing, grow in cheerful endurance. Now, that's a, that's a mouthful. Woe. 
Now, if he told me to grow in endurance, I would expect that. When I look this word up, when it says grow and, uh, and add to your face temperance and patience, it means cheerful endurance. Remember what James, how James said it? He said, count it all joy when you fall into these various temptations and trials. And you, uh, What a challenge. I said, God, it's one thing for you to call me to be patient. I can expect that. But to be glad about it? To be cheerful in it? Here's how you be cheerful in it. Remember Elisha on the mountain? His servant is going berserk because he sees the army surround him. Elisha's sitting up there calm as a cu cu cucumber. And the servant says, Ho, oh, oh, ho, master, how shall we do? He said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And he opens his eyes and he sees this mountain and all around him are these angels, these flaming, fiery angels. And, he, he, and, and, and you know, the prophet's like, hey, they're with us. And then the, then the servant goes, nah, 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 to the army of men. Nah, 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 I dare you to come up here. What happened to the servant? A minute ago, he was scared for his life. It doesn't say that he said, nah, 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 I did that. All right. But his fear was taken away. What happened? He saw the invisible world that by faith you and I can see. We can believe that our God is sitting on his throne, like he says, and he's ruling and he's watching over us every minute. And when you believe that, faith tells you that the enemy can't do anything to me that God doesn't allow. And when he does allow, God's got a purpose for it. And sometimes he does. Then the fifth thing, grow in striving to be more like Jesus. When it says add to your, your faith all of these things, then it says add godliness. And you can just break that down, and it means reverence toward God that guides your life. It's, it's a godly life. Now, look back in verse 3. We didn't read it, but in verse 3 of this same chapter, we started in verse 5. But verse 3 said, talking about Jesus and us, it said, according to his divine power, he'd given to us how many things? All things that pertain unto, I underlined it, life and godliness, same word, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. You know what Jesus said? He said, come unto me. All you that are labor, labor and heavy laden. All you who are worked up about life and under this heavy burden of life, this thing's getting you down, it's, it's about to kill you. You're overloaded with life. He said, come unto me and learn of me. Knowledge of me. Learn of me. And you're going to find rest for your soul. You see, Jesus is... Our faith is about knowing Jesus. We start with faith in Jesus. That's what we, how we're saved. And then we move from faith and we say, you know what? Faith tells me I'm, I, I will be better off if I live my life for Jesus. I haven't been living all of my life for Jesus. There are some areas where I've been, uh, you know, failing and I've been giving in to my appetites and my desires. And you know what I want to do from this point on? I'm going to be a man of God, a woman of God, a young person of God. I am going to live by faith. I'm going to move toward these things. And I want to live a godly life. And God says, I've already given you everything that pertains to that. It's already yours. But you've got to add it to your faith by the action of faith. You do it. And then we think about the, the sixth thing, growing and loving your church family. When I think about uh, wanting to be more like Jesus, when I thought about the word godliness and I studied it, I came up with one word that kind of stood out in, in the study. A lot of times I'll read different guides, different things, different dictionaries and commentaries, things, and I'll look. And one word kind of jumped out at me. It's the word motivation. I want to be like Jesus. I want to let his mind be in me that was also in Christ Jesus. I want to be like him. And that's the motivation. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to be pleased with my life. That motivation, that motivation drives us, compels us. It's a motivation of love. When he says, and that's why I say growing in love. And he said, and add to that godliness, brotherly kindness. Now, what is that? That's love. Brotherly kindness is love for the family. That's what it means, definition. If I tell you the word, when I tell you the word, you're going to know it immediately. 
It's the word Philadelphia. The city in Pennsylvania that's called Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. That's where the name came from, the Greek word Philadelphia. And right here he says, add to your godliness, wanting to be like Jesus, wanting to be the, the man, the woman, the young person that God wants you to be, add to it family love. Now let me say this. If you've worked in the church for very long, you found out you need a big load of Philadelphia. Right? You need a double dose of Philadelphia. Because we're not all always so lovely, are we? Listen, if you've got a family at home, if you're going to be the family God wants you to be, you need a truckload of Philadelphia. Amen? That's what it takes. That's what it takes. We've got to be driven, love-driven. You've heard me preach many times. The Christian life is love-compelled, love-driven. It's not duty or necessity or restraint. It's not keeping a bunch of rules or keeping a bunch of laws. It's a life with Jesus. It's a love life with Jesus. It's Jesus, our, our bridegroom, and we the bride. It's a life lived with Jesus. Listen, even the best folks can fail you. I never wake up on a day and say, I want to fail. But I fail a lot. I don't want to, but I do, just like you. And maybe you're sitting there today or listening, and you're thinking, well, Brother Larry, you don't know how badly I failed. Well, I probably don't know exactly about your life, but I know how badly all of us have failed. We've all failed. Do you know this long list of Hebrews 11 people? that God is bragging on. Go through it and read about their lives. Go back and look them up and read their stories. All of them had failures. There's only a couple of people that God doesn't bring anything, doesn't tell us enough about their life to reveal a failure. Almost all of them had failures. Exposed. They all had failures but got exposed. So grow in family love. Now it takes faith in God to love people through the ups and downs of life. Folks, we're damaged goods. We need to quit thinking of ourselves as we've arrived. We've apprehended. We've got an opinion for everybody else, and they ought to listen to us because we know. Listen, our opinion is Jesus. What people need is Jesus. They don't always need, need my opinion, although sometimes the opinion is right. What they need is Jesus. We're damaged goods, and one day God's going to complete what he started. He said, being confident of this very thing, Philippians 1, 6, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. One day God's going to get rid of Larry White, and I'm going to be all transformed. I'm going to be outside the realm of sin, temptation, and the humanness, what a day it's going to be. What a glorious day it'll be. One day God's going to complete us. Praise His name. Amen. And you know what the smart thing to do is? Work with Him now to get as much as completed now as you possibly can. That's what giving all diligence means. There's some things in some of your lives that you need to get out of your lives. And there's some things that you need to get into your lives that are right and good. And you're going to make up your mind. Are you going to do it? Well, here's where the battle's going to be. Are you going to do what God wants or are you going to do what you want? That's where the, Lord, that's where the battle over who's Lord is always. Listen, if God just said, Larry, have faith in me. you got a home in heaven, your sin's forgiven, which is true, and that's the end of it, there would be no struggle about right and wrong. God is calling us to a higher life. If you want, to, you want your life to abound... Now look at verse the, the, the seventh thing, the last one. Grow in overflowing love. And he doesn't stop with Philadelphia love. He said, and add to, add to family love, charity. Now if you're familiar with the New Testament and Greek language and all, you've heard this word, it's agape. Translated charity here. Translated love by most translations. It means a feast of love. Have you ever sat down to a feast? 
I mean, have you ever sat down to your favorite food fixed just exactly like you like it? And I mean, you just can't help it. You eat too much. I mean, it's a feast. You know what God is saying? He's saying to this. He said, we should have such a life that when people encounter us, they sense a feast of love. I told about this in the first service. And many, many years ago, I was preaching a, a, a revival on the book, Returning for Personal Revival. And I was in a church outside Jonesboro, Arkansas. And it's, it's a church about 100 people. And that Sunday morning, I preached, and it, nothing happened. It was kind of kind of cold. And, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was just nothing was happening. And I was like, hmm, you know, okay. And so we came back that night. I preached again on the heart and about giving your heart to Christ and going all the way with Christ. A man came out of the... I was up at the pulpit and the pastor was standing down here during the invitation time and I was calling people to come. And a man came from the back and he came up and he came over this side and he stopped because a man came about the same time, this side, and he got right there and stopped and they were just looking at each other. And I won't tell you what it looked like to me. The pastor was going... And I couldn't see his face, but the people out there in that church, I could see it, and it was like, yikes. And they were going. And I was like, don't, don't go. I didn't know what was going on. I was like, what's happening here? And all of a sudden, this guy over here takes off, and this guy takes off, and they meet about right over here. And they fall on each other, and they start crying and hugging each other. You know the story we talk about Jacob and Esau, how they fell on their neck? This is it's the way it looked. The church went, I mean, the church just, man, God's spirit just moved. It was just like, whoa, the altars filled. I mean, it was just, we had a great revival that week. And I, after the service, I said to the pastor, I said, what happened here? You know, what was this? He said, these two men, men 20 years ago, their parents died. And they had a fight over the inheritance, and they're both deacons in this church. For 20 years, one sat on this side and one sat on this side, and they do not come to the same meetings. They do not come. They, they only come to church and sit like that. He said, tonight they got right with each other. Let me tell you what brotherly love. Brotherly love is we endure with each other. We love each other because we're connect, connected and can vote. But let me tell you what chari this charity love is. It's when you've hurt somebody and you go to get it right, you've offended them and you want to go make it right. It's a kind of love that's a feast of love. It's a kind of love that feeds people's souls. It's a kind of love that feeds the body of Christ. When revival takes place, folks, people are going to get right with each other. Families are going to be restored. Relationships will be rebuilt. It happens all the time where God moves. Now listen to this and we'll close. Verse 8. For if these things be in you, these seven things added to your faith and abound. I mean, they're, they're, they're abound in you. They make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes people come to me and they say, Brother Larry, my life is just barren. My life is just unfruitful. I want to ask you, are you adding to your faith these seven things? Listen, these seven things can't be in your life and your life be unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus. Because the more you're learning about Jesus, the closer you're drawing to him. That's why Jesus said, learn of me. You'll find rest for your souls. I say in that, God made you for better things than this world has to give. So he gave Jesus to all who believe in him. Jesus is the best. If you have him he, and he has you, you have God's best. Let me ask you, do you have Jesus? That's the first big question because the Bible says a Christian life starts with faith and it goes from faith to faith. You start with putting faith in Jesus. I'm going to trust you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. I want you to take over in my life. And then you say, God, I want to grow in faith. I want to move in faith. 
I want to operate and live in faith. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of what the human life, of living life with your purposes and your plans, if those plans are not in Jesus? They're empty and they're vain. No matter how hard you try, you can't make it work for you. Because it's without Christ. It's without knowledge increasing in Christ. It's not growing in Christ. It's not moving in Christ and living for Christ. But when you're living for Christ and moving for Christ and doing for Christ, and you say, well, brother, how do you do it? You just ask yourself this question. Can I do this for Jesus and his glory? When you leave here today and you're tempted to do something and you question it, whether it's right, you just say, can I do this for Jesus? If you can't, don't do it. And you say, if I do this, will this bring glory to Jesus? If it will, do it. Make your life about Jesus. Let me tell you what life will become if you don't have Jesus growing in your life, even if you're a Christian. It it becomes cynical and critical and miserable. That's what it becomes. But that's not what God wants for you. You know what he said? He's already given in Christ everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's already ours. How do you access it? You say, God, I'm going to trust you and do it your way. I'm going to do it your way instead of mine. Let's stand. Father, I thank you for your word. God, thank you that you bring us to the place to do life your way. So God, help my brothers and sisters. And if there are any here who are listening or listening through the media that are not Christian, they've never put their life, their faith in Christ and their life in His hands, that this moment they'll trust Jesus. You say, Brother Larry, what do I do? You just tell Jesus you want Him to be the Lord in your life. You want Him to take over in your life. And you're going to be His follower. Or if you're a Christian already and you say, Brother Larry, I'm out of step with God. My life doesn't, it's not a picture of faith. It's a picture of frustration and struggle. And you do what the people in the Bible did when they found themselves like that. God said, return unto me and I'll return unto you, says the Lord. It's called repentance. You break down before God and say, forgive me, God. I have sinned. I've done wrong. And from this point on, I'm going to strive to do life your way. You won't be perfect, but you're going to strive to do it God's way. And what you're going to do is grow. God is calling you. Or maybe you've got a different decision you need to make. This is your invitation. Do what God is leading you to do. Say yes to Him. Just before we close, I just want to tell you, oftentimes I know people who are professing believers who are living their lives in opposition to what they know God wants. And their life goes from one heartbreak to another. Because God's not going to let life work. He doesn't let life work for us when we're not right with Him. We can say, I'm going to make it work. No, you can't. You're not going to be fruitful. Your life is going to be barren and unfruitful. But if you abound in faith and add to your faith these things, your your life will be fruitful. It will not be barren. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help us leave here today to give all diligence to add to our faith these simple things. They're not complex, but Father, you know they're a great trial for us. Help us strive to be love-driven for Jesus. Teach us more about Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen.
God bless you. I invite you back tonight at 5. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours.